Hi, and welcome to Brainy Moms Podcast. I am Terry Miller, and I'm going solo this week without our usual host, Dr. Amy Moore. We are missing her very much, but I have the honor of interviewing Megan Ettinger of the No BS Mama Podcast and Facebook group. Megan is a working mom of three who married her high school sweetheart. And as a young mom, she struggled silently as she lost herself in motherhood. Now Megan is passionate about having conversations about parenting and mental health so other moms don't feel so alone. Mm -hmm. I'm so glad you're here, Megan. Thank you so much, Terry. It's so nice to be here. Good. Well, I want to start off with a little background. In your podcast, you talk about being a young mom, very young mom, <laughs> three kids by the age of 23. So tell us a bit about your story and what brought you to the work that you're doing today, encouraging other moms. Sure. Um, so very long story, very short. Um, when I was a senior in high school, my boyfriend and I found out that we were pregnant, um, obviously very, very scary. You know, we weren't sure how we were going to tell our parents what we were going to do, you know, long-term, um, my family ended up moving States on the day that I graduated from high school. So I immediately moved in with him and his family and had our first baby after, right after I turned 18, which was a blessing because at the time, you know, they weren't sure which ward of the hospital I was going to be in because was I going to be treated as a pediatric or as an adult? Um, so there was a lot of stuff that was just really up in the air. And then after my oldest was born, I fell into a postpartum depression. I had no idea at the time, even though the doctors give you like kind of a rundown of it and they'll check in on you on your six week appointment. But I lied. I thought that what I was feeling was normal. Um, fast forward, we got married, we bought a house, we, um, have two more children and I kind of go in and out of depression. Not really, not really knowing that that's what I'm experiencing. I just feel like, you know, kind of crazy. And, um, now here we are, I, you know, we'll get a little bit into it later, but with the pandemic, I fell very deep into a depression and had no choice but to get some help. Um, and so I'm really, really glad that I was able to do that and have that support around me. And um, now our oldest is 17 and he'll be on his way to college next year. So we're getting there. <laughs> wow. Oh my goodness. So he is at the age you are when you were pregnant. Mm -hmm. That's got to be sobering. Oh, Yeah. <laughs> Well, so that's folks, listeners, that's what we're talking about today is the big D word depression. And it's a hard subject. Um, I think a lot of moms struggle with it. Don't admit it. Just like Megan was talking about it, talking about, and, and don't know it, not just don't admit it, but don't know it. Mm -hmm. And, um, even though I know with the pandemic pandemic, there's more and more acceptance of depression. I still think that a lot of people, a lot of moms are dealing with the stigma of depression, this embarrassment, this shame, mm -hmm. and, um, yeah, they don't want to talk about it. And so we're going to talk about it anyway. And our hope is that we can normalize it that we can just share some stories here. And so that listeners, you maybe won't feel so alone. You won't feel like you're such a terrible person that, man, you love this baby, you love being a mom, but some days you want to tear your hair out too. Mm -hmm. So, so Megan, you wrote about, and you just mentioned a little bit, um, falling apart during the pandemic mm -hmm. and then putting yourself back together again. So if you would, if you're okay with that, if you could tell us about that season and how you didn't realize how bad it was, you thought your symptoms were normal or, you know, just okay. You could mm -hmm. deal with it. And you wrote, tell us a little more about it, that it wasn't until your husband moved out that you finally got the help you needed. So yeah. share that with our listeners. Yeah. So going back to March of 2020, um, at the time I was already working from home. My husband worked in a corporate office. The kids were all going to school. Um, and we were actually housing an exchange student from Spain. And so she was in contact with her family in Spain, watching the pandemic unfold there. 
and the lockdowns and everything. And we were so naive. We were like, that would never happen here. <laughs> we'll never right. go into lockdown here. Um, and you know, the decision was made at school that she was going to stay with us and quarantine here instead of leaving and going home. Um, and then on like March 12th, the day before everything really shut down, she got a phone call saying that they were going to close the borders. And if she didn't get home, like right now that they didn't know when she was going to be able to get home. It could be over a year. Right. Um, and so overnight we lost Christina, a member of our family. We lost, um, the kids lost going to school. My husband now works from home. So now we're all together and, you know, my mom's a nurse. And so she was dealing with COVID all the time. I have a big family and we're used to being together a lot. And, you know, some of us were trying to still get together while some of us were trying to be a little bit more safe. And so like everyone else, my whole world was just turned upside down. And, um, I started to recognize that like, I wasn't getting out of bed on the weekends because we weren't going anywhere. No one needed me. Um, and so I would, I would let myself do that. And I thought that I was just allowing myself the rest. Right. And then looking back, I'm able to recognize now, I didn't recognize it at the time, but slowly I started to become like more and more of a shell. And what I mean by that is I recognized that like my family would be joking and having fun at the dinner table and I would not be participating in that. Um, I would be, you know, preparing dinner and I would just be so annoyed by everyone else's presence. And to a certain degree, that was normal for that stage of quarantine, um, but not to the level that I was experiencing it. And like you mentioned, you know, this idea of depression has become normalized with the pandemic and everything that everyone's been through. And so on all of my social feeds, everyone was, you know, no one is okay right now. Like it's okay not to be okay. And so I thought that it was okay. It was, this is just a normal reaction to the state of the world. Right. Um, yeah. yeah. And so I wasn't recognizing it. It was obviously causing trouble in my marriage and depression is a liar, right? So my depression was telling me, you know, Megan, it's not your fault. It's his fault. He doesn't understand. He's not doing the right things. Um, and it got to a point that we were just so combative and so at odds um, that he, we decided that it would be better if, if he moved out. Um. Yeah. And I mean, we're talking, we in February, we'll have been together 20 years now. So, <laughs> so hard. Yeah. Oh my goodness. And so yeah. that's, and so you said that was when that was the wake up call for you. It was. Um, so to, to like back up just a little bit, I had previously gone on medicine for um, anxiety and depression, and I did not have a great experience. And prior to the pandemic, I worked with my doctor and came off of the medicine. Mm -hmm. And my husband, part of our biggest problem at the time was that he was encouraging me to, to go back on medicine. And my thought process was, you just want me to be more tolerable for you. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to live my life as a watered down version of myself to make you comfortable. That was, that was what depression was telling me was happening. Really what was happening was he was recognizing that I was an absolute mess and that I needed help beyond what he could provide. Right. Um, but depression wouldn't let me see that or hear that until I had that actual physical separation. And I was able to sit back and say, oh my God, like he is right. He's right. Yeah. And so something had to be done. And so you made a shift. Mm -hmm. What's tell us about that shift. Tell us about kind of that next step. What happened next? Sure. So the very first thing that I did was I found a therapist mm -hmm. for the first time. Um, she was wonderful. She had children. They were a little bit younger than my children, but she understood like that phase of life. 
Um, she lived a little bit further away from me. So one of the blessings with COVID was that this kind of stuff became so much more accessible because you weren't really bound to, you know, your own neighborhood. You had all of these other options now. Um, and so I would meet with her once a week and she suggested that I take medicine. And I still was like, mm, yeah. I don't want to do that. <laughs> right. Um, but I was still having, you know, along with depression, I also suffer from anxiety. So I was still having panic attacks pretty regularly, um, you know, racing thoughts. I just still was, I was better than I was, but still not great. Um, and so I really needed her encouragement to walk me through the process of finding a medicine that would work for me. Um, and so, you know, we had to have that conversation. She, she explained, you know, not every medicine is right for everybody. Not, you know, just because you go on medicine now doesn't mean you have to stay on medicine forever. It could be just for this season. Maybe it's just for the next year or two. Like you really have to experiment and, and find what works for you. You can't just try one and hate it and just never, never use a medicine again. Right. I think it's, well, yeah, what, what you're talking about, that process of investigation, that's a hard part of it, I think, yeah. for us as moms, because we don't have time. <laughs> we don't have time to lay around and feel bad. And we don't have time to say, okay, I'm going to try, I, you know, I'm, I know I'm a wreck. I'm not being a good mom. I'm going to try this new medication. Oh, but guess what? The first two weeks of it, I'm going to be a zombie. I don't have time to be a zombie. And I think a lot of, a lot of us struggle with that. Like, okay, this one didn't work because I'm a zombie and we have to, there's a timeline. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not going to say I am diagnostic or anything with medication. That's not my specialty. That's not my lane. I'm speaking as a mom, mm -hmm. just as a mom, as a fellow depressed person, <laughs> that it's a, it is a long haul. It's a process of figuring out which medication works. And it's not just a couple of weeks. It's like 30 days, 45 days, two months mm -hmm. to give it a chance. Was that your experience too, that as you've kind of tried different things that it wasn't, wasn't quick fix? hundred yeah. percent. Um, and so I was really lucky because she, the, the therapist works with a doctor, um, and so she got me an appointment with a doctor that she's familiar with. And so now I have a team of people, right? So before I went for, to my own general practitioner, um, and they gave me the sheet that diagnoses you with, you know, how often, how often do you feel sad? Is it, you know, once a week, twice a week, never, you know, um, checklist. And, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> And so you check the boxes and, you know, depending on your, your risk level for anxiety and depression, they just write you a prescription, mm -hmm. um, or at least that was my experience. Um, and so now I have this therapist who I've allowed to communicate with the person that I'm seeing who's prescribing the medicine. Um, and this appointment was so much more thorough. Um, she asked me a lot of questions about the prior medicine that I had been on, my reactions to it. Um, now that I am talking more about it and, um, I'm sharing more, I know that there are other members of my family who are also on anxiety and depression medicine. So I'm able to share with her medicines that have and have not worked for other members of my family. Um, and so that's really helpful too. Like once you start talking about this stuff, you would be amazed you would be amazed at the amount of people that you know that are taking something to treat a mental illness. Right. And I think that's, it shouldn't surprise us so much. It's not like, it's not like um, this hasn't always been going on. Mm -hmm. We just know more about it. We're learning more. And so we're learning better ways to, to treat depression, to treat anxiety. And I think there is the fact that I know the world's always been hard and it's always hard to be a mother, but there is a lot that we're dealing with <laughs> as moms right now. I mean, we are making history. I mean, this pandemic has rocked the foundations of the entire earth mm -hmm. of our culture. And, and it's, it's silly to think that that doesn't rock the foundations of who we are yeah. as a human being, as a, as a mom, as a wife, as a friend, um, yeah, it's, it's, 
big stuff. It's not small stuff. And it's been, it's been hard. Yeah. So you also talk about, I, I love that you talk about, um, the, pe- the perfect Peggy. And so I'm going <laughs> to, I'm going to read something from your, from your, uh, podcast here. You talk about the dangers of comparison and you wrote perfect Peggy up the street has well-behaved kids who only eat organic food and always have matching outfits. And they're always going on some exotic vacation. Why doesn't my life look like that? I must be doing something wrong. Mm -hmm. And Oh, is that about social media or what? Okay. So speak to that, speak to that about the dangers of comparison. Yeah. Um, I feel like we all have that one mom that just seems to have everything together, right? Whether it's someone, you know, from the PTA or one of your kids, friends, moms, or the baseball mom or wherever this, this mom exists for all of us. Right. Um, and with the social media, this mom's presence is always in our face. And what we forget about social media is that it is perfectly curated content. People don't post things you know, you only get to see this like tiny, tiny little glimpse, even if, if it's someone who posts, you know, every day or like several times a day that you're seeing them on your feed, you have to remember that is still such a teeny tiny piece of their life. Um, and so even if this person is put together in the ways that you think you're not, um, you have to remember that it is very likely that that person has flaws that either you don't see because you're not, um, those aren't things that bother you or those aren't things that you're insecure about. So maybe you don't see them in her, Um, but they're there, whether she's covering them up or whether you just choose not to see them because you're looking at all the perfect aspects of her life. um, They they still exist. There is no perfect person. There's no perfect mom. Um, And something that was said a lot during quarantine was there's no, you're not going to get a prize for being like the best quarantine mom. Like I think back then, you know, there were kids who were like always making sourdough bread with their mom or like, you know what I mean? Like every day people had like all of these fun things that they were doing with their kids. And it was like, what the hell? I have work. I have, you know, all of these other things I have to do. I don't have hours a day to be entertaining my kids in this way. Mm -hmm. Um, And so you just have to realize that, you know, some people have access to more resources, you know, all of those things come together and, you know, it's not, you're not comparing apples to apples ever. Yeah. That's such a good, that's such a good thing to remember. I've got a I've got a friend and I'm not dogging her when I say this, she and I have had very transparent conversations, but she just happens to be gorgeous. Mm -hmm. Um, She has six kids and it seems like they do adventures a lot. It's probably not as lot uh, as a lot. It's probably not as often as I think, but it seems like it, like she's always posting about, oh my goodness, they're at the zoo. They're at the aquarium. They're at the lake. Oh, they take a trailer. They go camping. And it seems like she's just always doing these amazing things. And she has these sweet selfies, you know, with her youngest and, mm-hmm. and then her teenager boy, you know, like, Hey mom, you know, and he's got his arm around her neck. And I'm like, yeah, my teenage son is in the other room and doesn't want me to look at him, you know? (laughs) And there's this, this thing that builds where we think she's got it all together. Okay. Here's the truth. She is in the middle of a horrific divorce. Mm -hmm. She is depressed. She is on, she's coming out of it because she is on medication. And here's a weird thing. She posts and began posting about a year and a half ago as a part of her own therapy yeah, as a part of her own self-love. And so who knows, there may be things that work out there. There may be moms that are overcompensating for so much pain and hurt on the other side. And they are desperately trying to say, I am okay. I am doing the best I can. I am doing right. And they're trying their best to capture those sweet moments Mm -hmm. because we can all be certain for every sweet moment, there are 99 other crappy ones. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, and you know, it's, you have to look back at yourself too and think, 
there are things that you are doing that someone else is looking at and saying, wow, I wish I had that. Yeah. Right. Not, um, not knowing all of the other things that, that are on your shoulders that you're wearing. So um, an example of that is this summer, we took a three week RV trip across the country. And I know that a lot of people were like, wow, that's so cool. Like I, I could never do that, blah, blah. Well, but the reality is like, we don't have air conditioning in the house that we live in. You know what I mean? Like we, we value that over air conditioning. And so that's what we chose. Um, and so again, it just, nobody can see that I don't have air conditioning where I live. Right. So you just always have to remember that you are that mom for someone else in a lot of ways. That's so good. Hey, that brings us to the next thing. I also just really, really loved in your podcast. Um, I listened to several episodes, like I told you, and I was struck um, by in several episodes, your fixation on authenticity. Mm -hmm. And I just so appreciate it. I think it's so important. And again, that kind of goes to that social media thing that I know we're talking about. You can't just say all that social media is truth. And sometimes it's actually helping a mom, you know, capture the sweet moments. And yet tell us more about why it is important for mental health to be your authentic self. Talk about that. Yeah. I think that a lot of us struggle even within our own family, right? Our family is supposed to be our safe place. And I'm not talking about, you know, your partner and your children. I'm talking about, you know, your mom and your aunts and your uncles and, you know, your extended family a little bit. That's supposed to be your safe place. But I think a lot of us, you know, when it comes to those people and some of our closest friends, we're still afraid to let certain pieces of us show because it's embarrassing, right? Those pieces of us that aren't so pretty, that aren't so put together. Um, we, it, we feel like it makes us a target. We feel like maybe people are going to talk about us after we leave or, you know, any of those things. And the fact of the matter is going back to the perfect Peggy, like if you talk to any other mom of any other teenage boy, she's going to tell you the same thing. Like, He's over. He wants nothing to do with me. You know what I mean? He eats me out of house and home. I never see him. Um, and so here you are in your house thinking that it's just you and just your child and just your partner experiencing those things because no one else is talking about it. Um, and when you, especially when you are experiencing anxiety and depression, the, you already have thoughts telling you that you're not good enough that you're all alone, you know, that there's something wrong with you. And so if you're, if you don't have people in your life that are sharing the, you know, not so great parts of the things that they're experiencing, you, it's so much easier to believe these intrusive thoughts when they come up. Right. Yeah. And to believe that it's like you said, it's only me. Mm -hmm. Oh, and that's a dangerous place. Yeah. Well, hey, we need to take a quick break and um, I'm going to read a word from our sponsor and then we'll be back. And I want to, I want to dig in a little bit more um, into the importance of authenticity and um, Megan, your hope for, for moms struggling with depression. Did you know that more than 6 million children in America have been diagnosed with ADHD? Many of them struggle in school because of their condition. What if I told you that poor attention may not be the primary cause of their struggles? In a research study with more than 5,000 people with ADHD, we found their working memory, long-term memory, and processing speed were less efficient than their attention skills. So an intervention that only targets attention might miss the opportunity to work on those other skills we need to think and learn. Learning RX can help you identify which skills may be keeping your child from performing their best. In fact, we've worked with more than 100,000 children and adults who wanted to think and perform better. We'd like to help get your child on the path to a brighter and more confident future. Give us a call at 866-BRAIN-01 or visit learningrx.com. Again, that's learningrx.com. And we are back with Megan Eddinger. And Megan, we're talking about the importance of authenticity. 
And I want to hear about that in relation to the importance of community and how those work together. Why is it so important for moms to be authentic, to share that transparency and to find a community of women for everyday support? Yeah. So for me, it goes back to that concept of feeling very alone. Um, you know, whether you're a young mom, whether you are, you know, the first mom in a generation, um, whether you are a mom who experiences anxiety and depression, whether you're a mom of a kid with um, special needs, like there are so many different kinds of moms. And I think that somewhere along the line, we all go through this phase, whether it's in the beginning or, you know, really the whole time where we feel like, very alone in our experiences um, and, you know, in, in the decisions that we're making and, and everything, it's, it's very, very isolating and very, very lonely. And it's, it can be a very dangerous place to be. Um, and so my mission is to make sure that no other mom ever feels alone during those challenging times. Um, and so I'm trying to build a community where women can come for like general connection. So like fun things, right. We can share our, our successes and our wins and things that we're excited about, but more so a safe place for moms to come when they are experiencing something hard, because, you know, there's two sides to the internet, right? One is like crazy and very dangerous and not so nice. And the other is this really great place where you can find connections with people halfway across the world that can be a really great place of love and support for you that you don't have anywhere else in your life. Um, and I think that we've all experienced that mom group where some poor mom posts something that she needs help with and all these perfect Peggy's chime in and tell her how bad of a mom she is and, and what a bad decision that was. And it's like, that's not helpful and good for you that you're a perfect parent and you always make the right decisions. But this mom came here asking for help and you just made her feel bad. Right. And that's no good. That's not authenticity. Yeah. <laughs> because if we're giving advice, if we're just giving advice, we're not saying, you know what? I've been there too. Maybe it didn't look exactly like that, but I've been there and I've made bad decisions and I've been struggling with this and that. It's almost like we need to as moms, we need to first say, okay, I don't have my crap together, mm -hmm. but I did learn this one thing and you might try it. It's not yeah. like we can't help each other. Um, but yeah, to just chime in, well, if you would only sit and read with your child for 15 minutes every night, you would build bonds of unity, you know, like, yep, whatever <laughs> by the evening, I'm ready to throw my child in the garbage can, you know? <laughs> And that's the honesty. I mean, you know, we should read our kids. I know, but <laughs> it's hard. It's just hard. It is hard, especially at bedtime. Are you kidding? Oh, exactly. So exhausting. So you have a Facebook community. Tell us about that and what you're hoping, what you're hoping that's going to grow into. Yeah. So thank you so much. It's a uh, brand new. So we're just getting off the ground. Um, but just like I said, I really want this to be a place where moms can come and find that comfort. Um, and so I, I will go live in there and share things that I'm personally dealing with, hoping to strike up conversation because people are not quick to jump in and share what they're struggling with. Right. Um, they'll, you know, they'll send me a, a direct message. Um, they'll share in that way, but they're not quick to post in a community of strangers. And so I'm trying to create a space where people do feel comfortable coming and, and sharing what they're dealing with, whether they're asking for help or not. Some people just need to let it out, right? Um, because their spouse doesn't understand or, um, you know, they don't have a good relationship with their mom or what, whatever the case may be. Some people just don't have a support system in real life. And so I think it's really important to create a space that's safe for everyone, but especially those people that don't have that support system. Right. And I think especially with um, the pandemic, there was such a, a withdrawal. We are, we have over this past summer, I know had more opportunities to get face to face, but things are, I mean, I know in my small town, things are closing down again. Things are getting very isolated. And so to have an online community 
where we can build relationships and be vulnerable, um, ask for help, but also just vent. That's, that's such a need. That's so beautiful. So yeah, do, do you, does it have a name? What's your Facebook group called? Uh, it's just called the No BS Mama Community. So you can find okay. it on Facebook there and I can share a link with you so you can put that right in the show notes if people Perfect. want to take it out. Yeah, we'll do that for sure. Well, I hope listeners that you are encouraged that you're not alone, um, that if you're struggling with depression, if you're just struggling with the hard mental anguish of being a mama, which it is, it's beautiful and it's hard. Um, but I hope you feel encouraged. Yeah. That there are people that can be here for you and you don't have to be perfect. Peggy. Was that the name? Peggy. Perfect. (laughs) Perfect. Peggy. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So we're out of time. We need to wrap up, but you know, before we go, um, Megan, is there anything else you'd want to leave our listeners with anything else you'd want to share? Um, if you take just one thing from this episode, it would be to ask for help. Just take that one step and ask for help. It does not make you weak. It definitely does not make you a bad mom. If anything, it makes you strong and it makes you the best mom possible. So please, please, please take that step and get help. So good. So good. So I do want to um, remind everyone that this episode is not a substitute for medical advice or for professional therapy. Um, We've just been sharing personal stories that I hope is encouraging. And um, if you are experiencing symptoms of depression, please consult your doctor or a mental health provider. And if you are feeling acutely desperate, if you're really feeling scary bad, please don't just keep going on. Please reach out for help and you can reach the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 800-273-TALK, 800-273-8255, that's T-A-L-K, 800-273-TALK. Hold on to that. If you're driving and you're feeling desperate, pull over, grab a phone, reach out and get help. You're not going to be reported to somebody for calling that line. You're just going to get help and encouragement. And there is no shame in that. Mm -hmm. So Megan, thank you. Thank you so much for your transparency, for your willingness to talk about the the heartache of of depression. And listeners, if you'd like to hear more um, from Megan, tune into her episodes of the No BS Mama podcast. You can also follow her on Instagram at megan.edinger, um, or you can find her on Facebook, Megan Fish Edinger, and we'll make sure to put those links on our show notes. So thank you so much for listening to this episode. And if you like our show, we'd be so grateful, grateful if uh, you'd give us a five-star rating and a review on Apple Podcasts. If you'd rather watch us, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel and please follow us on social media at the brainy moms, Instagram and Facebook. So look until next time, we know you're busy moms and we're busy moms. So we're out. See ya. Bye.